Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel for a brand new mystery with Molly. If you are new around here, if you have never seen my face on your screen before, then hi, my name is Molly. And I post true crime videos like this every single week. So if you think that that is something that you might want to stick around for, then please do subscribe. And don't forget to switch on the little notification bell so that YouTube will let you know whenever I post a new video. This week, we are going to be talking about the solved case of the Bennett family. They were a family of four from Colorado who were horrifically attacked by a predator who would be dubbed the Hammer Killer. Only one member of this family survived the terrifying ordeal and despite the forensic evidence the police had obtained in the case, it ultimately took more than three and a half decades to actually identify the Hammer Killer and bring him to justice. But quickly before we get into the case, please listen carefully to the following. This video is about the murders and attempted murders of several people, including children. It involves heavy themes such as rape and sexual assault, including the sexual assault of a child, drug addiction, mental health issues, and suicide. Viewer discretion is advised. So for this week's case, we are going back just under four decades now to early 1984 in the city of Aurora, which is located in the state of Colorado in the US. And Aurora is where the Bennett family lived. The Bennett family consisted of married couple Bruce and Deborah Bennett who were 27 and 26 years old at the time that this case took place and their two children, their two daughters, Melissa who was seven years old and Vanessa who was three. But before we really get into what happened to this family, let's talk more about them, about the kind of people that they were, starting with Deborah. So Deborah was born in 1957. I believe she was one of four siblings, the oldest of four siblings and tragically when Deborah was just 12 years old she lost her mother. Her mother sadly passed away and so being the oldest Deborah kind of took on that role. She became that mother figure to her younger sibling. Her brother Larry said that Deborah was so incredibly caring and affectionate and that they wouldn't have been able to do it without her. She really was the glue that held the family together after the loss of their mum. She was so strong. And then a couple of years later, I think when she was in her teenage years, Deborah met Bruce Bennett. Bruce was born in 1956 and he was described as having a good sense of humour. He was an entertainer, always making people laugh. He loved activities such as bowling, which he would often play with Deborah's brother, Larry. And he was actually a very, very good friend of Larry's. And I believe that's how Bruce and Deborah came to meet. They met through Larry. They got on really, really well. They became close, fell in love and started dating and eventually they got married. And in early 1976, the couple welcomed their first child, Melissa. I believe Deborah was a stay-at-home mum and Bruce actually joined the Navy to provide for his family. He worked as a solar analyst and he served for about four years between 1976 and 1980. And towards the end of his service, the couple's second child, Vanessa, was born. She was born in March of 1980. And it was Following the birth of Vanessa, when the Bennett family moved to Aurora in Colorado, they bought a house and they settled down. Bruce got a new job working at a furniture store which was run by his uncle and I think Deborah worked there occasionally too. And Bruce also enrolled at a local college where he began training to be an air traffic controller. That was his dream job that he hoped to land at some point in the future. And the family of four seemed to be content. They lived a relatively quiet life but it it was a happy one. Deborah and Bruce enjoyed watching their daughters grow up and the girls, Melissa and Vanessa, were close. They would play together a lot. Vanessa recalls how when the two girls would get in trouble, she would always be that cheeky younger sibling who would try to blame her big sister, Melissa, so that she could avoid getting told off. Melissa was described as being a very smiley little girl. She loved to laugh and she always had a smile on her face. And in January of 1984, Melissa was about to turn eight years old and so the family decided to hold a little party for her. On the evening of the 15th of January 1984, a load of other extended family members came over to Bruce and Deborah's home to celebrate Melissa turning eight. She was going to be turning eight in a couple of days time so they had a little party, they had some cake, probably played some games. By all accounts it was a really lovely fun evening and then later that night the party came to an end and the guests said goodbye 
goodbye to the Bennett family and left. Little did they know at the time when they left that that would actually be the last time they would see the family alive because just the following morning, the morning of the 16th of January 1984, concerns for the family were raised when both Bruce and Deborah didn't turn up for work. As I said a minute ago, the couple both worked for Bruce's uncle at his furniture store and they were both supposed to be in for a shift that morning, but neither of them showed up and they didn't contact the store to let them know that they weren't coming in, which was so out of character for them. And so Bruce's uncle got in touch with his sister, Bruce's mother, Connie, and he told her that Bruce and Deborah hadn't come in. And so Connie immediately started trying to call them, call their house phone. However, no one picked up. I believe she called several times and she never got an answer. And so worried, Connie decided to head to their house the house that she was at just the night before for her granddaughter Melissa's birthday party. Now when Connie arrived at the house one of the first things that she noticed was that the garage door was open and that the couple's cars were still parked on the property which immediately indicated that the family must have still been home for some reason they hadn't gone out. However as Connie started walking closer to the house the next thing that she noticed on the ground was Deborah's purse. It looked like like it just been dropped outside which instantly made alarm bells ring because why would Deborah have just left her purse outside she wouldn't have done that so Connie walked through the garage to the door which was attached to the house this was the entrance to the house and the door wasn't locked it was open slightly and so Connie walked into the home and that was when she stumbled upon a gruesome horrifying scene as soon as she walked through the door she saw her son, 27-year-old Bruce Bennett, lying on the floor covered in blood and he was dead. Now some sources state that upon finding her son's body, Connie immediately called the police, whereas others seem to suggest that she checked out the rest of the house first. So I'm not entirely sure on the exact timeline of events in the immediate aftermath of finding Bruce's body. But regardless, quickly the police were at the scene and tragically Bruce's body was not the only one that was found inside the house. So Bruce's body was found downstairs. I think on the floor in the kitchen and when the police went upstairs they found the dead body of his wife Deborah. She was lying on the bed in the master bedroom. She too was absolutely covered in blood and she was completely battered. She had been savagely beaten around the head with a heavy object which the police determined was probably a hammer, a claw hammer and she had also been stabbed with a knife and her husband Bruce had sustained very similar injuries. He too had been stabbed, I believe just once in the neck, the killer slit his throat and he had also been beaten around the head with the hammer. And tragically, it's actually believed that during a violent struggle, Bruce tried to like run or crawl up the stairs to get to his family. It's thought that Bruce was attacked first and there was blood on the bottom of the stairs, I believe. So he tried to get up the stairs to protect his family from the killer but sadly he was unable to. His injuries were just too severe and so he couldn't save them and he died. But the utter horror of what was inside that house did not stop at the discovery of Bruce and Deborah's bodies. As the police continued walking around upstairs they walked into another room, a little girl's bedroom, and that was when they found seven-year-old Melissa Bennett also dead. She too had been hit in the head with a hammer which caused her death, and tragically Melissa had also been sexually assaulted by the killer. And I did read on one or two sources that Deborah had most likely been sexually assaulted by the attacker as well, and the youngest member of the family, three-year-old Vanessa, was also found in the same room as Melissa and Vanessa too was covered in blood. She had been badly beaten. Again, a couple of sources state that she too had been sexually assaulted. But unbelievably, by some miracle, Vanessa was actually still alive when the emergency services arrived at the scene. Despite the horrific injuries that she had sustained, she wasn't dead. She was clinging onto life. And so she was immediately rushed to the hospital where doctors began trying to save her. She was taken to a children's hospital in Denver 
Denver where she was put in a medically induced coma due to swelling of her brain. Vanessa had been struck many times with the hammer, mainly to the right side of her face. She was hit in the head, in the jaw. Her jaw was completely shattered. Her pelvis was shattered. She had broken bones in her arms and legs. It was horrendous, the injuries that this three-year-old girl has sustained, that the whole family had sustained. This was such a savage and vicious attack that just completely shocked the whole community in Aurora. Vanessa underwent several hours of surgery to try and repair the injuries to her head and brain. She had a metal plate fitted in her head and thankfully, again by some miracle, she did actually survive. She had a long, long road of recovery ahead of her but she survived the horrendous attack. She was the only survivor and because her parents were now dead, Vanessa began living with her grandmother, Connie Bennett. And of course, after finding the Bennett family's bodies, the Aurora Police Department knew that they had a triple murder inquiry on their hands and they immediately set out to find the sadistic individual that had committed this crime. So to begin their investigation, the police started looking further into this family. Who did they know? Was there anyone who possibly had a grudge against them for some reason? Did anyone in their lives have a motive for wanting to do this to them? Well, it seemed that no was the answer to that question. They couldn't identify anyone that would have had a motive. The family had no known enemies. Bruce and Deborah Bennett just weren't the type to have enemies. They were very nice, respectable people. So it seemed as though perhaps the killer was a complete stranger to the family. But then how did a complete stranger gain access into the home in the middle of the night? Just as a quick side note, according to sources, it's believed that the attack occurred sometime between midnight and about 6am on the 16th of January. But yeah, how did the killer get into the house in the middle of the night in order to murder the family? Well, it's believed through the garage door. As I said earlier, inside the garage, there was a door which led into the main house. And unfortunately, on the evening of the murders, it appeared as though Bruce and Deborah Bennett accidentally left their garage door open. Usually they would shut it every single night, but on this particular night, they forgot. Obviously it was Melissa's birthday party the evening before, so I imagine they were all probably very tired from that, and so they just forgot. It's an easy mistake to make. And there was a shoe print, I think in blood, in the garage. So that obviously showed that the killer had gone through the garage. This was the killer's shoe print. And when the police examined this shoe print further, they determined that it was a boot print and that they were probably the kind of boots that like a construction worker would wear. So for that reason, the police believed that the killer may have worked in construction. But the boot print wasn't the only evidence that the police found. They actually also discovered one of the murder weapons close to the driveway of the home. It was the knife, the knife that had been used to stab both Bruce and Deborah. It was found just discarded on the ground in the snow outside of the house where the killer had obviously ditched it. The other murder weapon, the hammer that was used to beat the victims around the head, wasn't found in or around the house and I believe the hammer has never been recovered to this day. But the knife was found and experts examined the knife for fingerprints. However, they weren't able to find any belonging to the killer, unfortunately. So perhaps he was wearing gloves that night when he committed the murders. But although they didn't find fingerprints, they they did manage to recover other evidence from the killer in the form of DNA. Traces of the killer's semen were found in Melissa and Vanessa's bedroom from where Melissa had been sexually assaulted. Semen was found on a section of the carpet that her body was lying on and semen was also discovered on this duvet that the killer had placed over Melissa's body after the attack. Now unfortunately back then, back in the early to mid 80s when this case occurred, signs scientists were not really able to do anything with this kind of evidence yet because of course DNA and forensic technology was still in its infancy but it was hopefully going to be very useful evidence later on down the line but at this moment in time the DNA evidence wasn't really going to assist them in identifying the perpetrator although as the investigation continued the police trying to solve the case of the Bennett family murders did become aware of other very very similar cases that had occurred in other areas in and around Aurora 
not long before the Bennetts had been killed. And so the police began to wonder whether the cases may have been linked, whether the man who murdered the Bennett family was a serial attacker. Just 12 days before the Bennetts were murdered, on the evening of the 4th of January 1984, a married couple named James and Kimberly Harbenschild were attacked in their home in the middle of the night. They lived in another part of Aurora, not too far from the Bennetts' address. Kimberly said that her partner James was making some music tapes that night. That was a bit of a hobby of his, making his own tapes. And so whilst he was doing that, she went to bed. She went off to sleep. However, in the early hours of the morning, she woke up suddenly because she had this intense, horrendous pain in her head. And as she opened her eyes and she looked up, she saw a figure standing at the edge of her bed holding a hammer. This figure had just hit Kimberly in the head with this hammer. Unfortunately, as I understand it, she couldn't really see this person's face because it was so dark. It was the middle of the night. She knew that it was a man standing by her bed, but she couldn't see his face. And then moments after she woke up, the man raised his hammer and he literally threw it at Kim, who was screaming and shouting for her partner, James. And as soon as he threw the hammer, the man ran out. He made a run for it. James had also been brutal brutally attacked with the hammer. He had suffered injuries to his head. Both James and Kimberly were covered in blood, but thankfully they survived the attack and they called the police. But then just five days after this, on the 9th of January 1984, so this was exactly a week before the Bennets were murdered, there was another hammer attack in another area in Aurora. A 28-year-old woman named Donna Dixon was attacked in the garage next to her home. She'd literally just pulled into her garage in her car and as soon as she got out of the car a man came at her with a hammer. He raped Donna in the garage and he hit her over the head with the hammer before fleeing at the scene but thankfully Donna too survived the attack. She was taken to the hospital to be treated for her injuries and she was in a very very critical condition but she did survive and she told the police everything she could remember about the attack including what she could recall about the attacker's appearance. She said that he was a white male with hair cut to about his shoulders, but that was really all that she could remember. And the attacks did not stop there. Just the day after Donna Dixon's case, on the 10th of January, a 50-year-old woman named Patricia Smith was attacked in her home. She lived in a house in the city of Lakewood in Colorado, which is just over 20 miles away from Aurora. And on the afternoon of the 10th, a stranger broke into her home and they sexually assaulted Patricia before repeatedly hitting her in the head with a hammer and unfortunately this time the victim did not make it. Patricia died from her injuries and then just six days later that was when the Bennets were killed in their home. There were three other separate cases that the police strongly believed may have been connected to the Bennett murders because there were so many similarities between these four crimes. All of the victims had been attacked in their homes or on their property. Many of the victims had been sexually assaulted. They'd all been attacked with a hammer. All of the cases had occurred within literally two weeks of each other. There were too many similarities to not think that. It seemed extremely, extremely likely that all of these crimes were committed by the same individual. And it seemed as though this may have been the beginning of a serial killer in Colorado, which of course absolutely terrified everyone. New News of these vicious attacks quickly spread around the area and everyone in the community lived in fear that they would be next, that they might be the next victim of the hammer killer. And I'm sure a huge part of why everyone was so scared was because it seemed as though the police weren't really getting anywhere with their investigations. It didn't seem as though they were close to catching the perpetrator and they weren't. The police really had no idea who was committing these crimes, who killed the Bennett family. Now, as part of their investigation, the police did try to get some information from the only survivor of the attack, three-year-old Vanessa Bennett. After she was eventually discharged from the hospital, the police had a professional, a therapist, speak to Vanessa. And they started trying to ask her what she could remember about the attack, what she could remember about the man who hurt her parents and sister. But they didn't really get anything out of her. Vanessa could 
couldn't remember a single thing, understandably. She was literally three years old and she had sustained severe trauma to her head. So of course she wasn't going to remember anything. And so they quickly gave up with that because Vanessa just had no memory of the attack. And apparently she would get quite upset and uncomfortable when the therapist would ask her about that night. So the police decided to just stop trying to get information out of her. And tragically, as the weeks and the months went by, the investigations into the hammer attacks and the Bennett murders just started to go quiet and turn cold. The police really exhausted all leads and lines of inquiry until eventually they just hit a dead end with the case and it remained unsolved. As I said earlier on in the video, little Vanessa, the only surviving member of the family, she went to live with her grandmother Connie after her parents' death and from what I can gather, Connie tried to give her the best possible upbringing given the circumstances but regardless, Vanessa had honestly a horrendous childhood by the sounds of it. Her school life was horrific. She was bullied so much by the other kids in school. They would make fun of her appearance and her face because obviously her face looked a little bit different than normal, I suppose, because of the injuries that she had sustained during the attack and kids would bully her for that. They would make fun of the fact that she had no parents. They would laugh at the fact that her parents were killed and the bullies would tell the other kids in school not to hang around with Vanessa or go to her house because if they did then they would be attacked by the crazy hammer man too. Can you even imagine going through what she went through as a child. Your parents and sister being killed and being on the brink of death yourself and then by some miracle surviving the attack only to have your peers bully you relentlessly in school for it. It's harrowing. And Vanessa was bullied so much to the point where she basically hated herself. She hated being her. She hated being known as the girl whose family were killed. And as you can imagine, this led to a lot of mental health issues, depression and anxiety. She developed anger issues and she would lash out, which caused a lot of problems and arguments between her and her grandmother, Connie, and also arguments between her teachers in school. She would get in trouble a lot at school. And Vanessa also recalls just being terrified all the time. She was always scared because of the fact that that the man who did this to her family hadn't been caught. The case was unsolved. And so she lived in fear. She lived her childhood in fear that one day the killer would find her and he would make another attempt on her life. Now, although the Bennett case unfortunately went cold, I don't believe it was ever really officially closed. I think the police would still follow up on any potential tips and leads over the years. And it was about five years after the murder in early 1989 when the police actually identified a possible suspect or person of interest in the case. Someone that they wanted to look into further just in case they could have had involvement in this crime. And that person was actually one of Bruce Bennett's brothers, Richard Bennett. Now how this all came about, the reason why Richard suddenly came onto the police's radar was because basically by this time, by 1989, unfortunately scientists still weren't really able to do anything yet with the semen evidence that had been collected from the crime scene. They weren't able to get a DNA profile of the killer from it yet. However, the police knew the way that forensic technology was headed. It was advancing all the time and they really hoped that at some point in the future, the semen evidence would be the key to solving the case and identifying the killer. And so even though this evidence still wasn't of use just yet, the police decided to kind of get a head start, I suppose, and start collecting DNA. DNA samples from the people in the Bennett's lives, their friends and family members, many of which attended seven-year-old Melissa's birthday party the night before the murders, including Bruce's brother, Richard. So the police asked Richard to come down to the police station so that DNA could be taken from him. And it was during this when Richard 
started just saying some really bizarre things to the police which seemed to kind of make alarm bells ring. He told the police that he had had these dreams in which he was floating around in a bubble outside of his brother's home by the master bedroom of the house by the window in that room and then all of a sudden the bubble popped and he was inside of the master bedroom and so he walked out of the master bedroom of the Bennett home and down the stairs he said that in his dream someone started chasing him around the house and then when he got into the kitchen he found the dead body of his brother Bruce. He basically said that in his dreams he witnessed the murders almost. Whilst he was sleeping his mind took him to the house that night and as you can imagine when the police heard this from Richard they were baffled and confused and they wondered if whether maybe that dream wasn't a dream after all maybe it was a reality maybe Richard actually was in the house that night because he was the one who killed his brother and his sister-in-law and his niece in addition to this strange dream another thing about Richard that aroused suspicion was the fact that he was a construction worker and as I mentioned earlier the police believed that the killer probably did work in construction because of the boot print that had been left by the perpetrator in the Bennett's garage they asked Richard if he owned similar boots as the ones that made the boot print and he actually did. He said that he did have some construction boots but that he got rid of them before the killings. The police continued looking into Richard but to be honest they never really found any solid evidence to link him to the crime. The only evidence they did have was barely even circumstantial so they could never arrest him or anything. And once again unfortunately following this the case went cold. Again the police had exhausted all leads and so the case stood at a standstill for a while. But fast forward to 2001, so this was about 16 to 17 years after the murders and thankfully by this time it was looking like there was going to be a huge development in this case because finally scientists felt confident that using the forensic technology they now had at their disposal they would be able to get a DNA profile from the evidence that had been recovered from the crime scene. The semen evidence on the carpet and duvet in seven-year-old Melissa's bedroom. And they were right, they were able to get a DNA profile from it. They now had the killer's DNA profile. So they could use this to compare against any suspects in the case. So they compared this profile against friends and relatives of the Bennett family. And through this process, they were able to rule everyone out as being the killer, including Richard Bennett. Richard's DNA was not a match to that of the killer. So he was innocent. The dream that he had really did seem to be just that a dream. And so the police entered the DNA profile into the Colorado DNA database and I think also the national DNA database. But sadly, again, there was no match. The killer's DNA was not on there. So that was yet another dead end. And there was not much more that the police could really do at that point. Apart from, I guess, keep checking the databases every year or so to see if eventually a match would pop up. So once again, the case came to a bit of a halt or at least that was until 2018, so nearly three and a half decades after the crime, when the detectives working on the Bennett case decided that it might be worth trying out a different approach. It might be worth trying out a DNA technique called genetic genealogy in an attempt to possibly identify the killer, because obviously genetic genealogy can help to find potential relatives of a person through their DNA. They brought in forensic scientist and genealogist Colleen Fitzpatrick and using the killer's DNA profile Colleen began searching through genealogy websites you know websites such as Ancestry and MyHeritage and it was this process that would ultimately provide the police with the breakthrough that they so so desperately needed because Colleen was able to tell the police that familial DNA matches strongly indicated that the killer probably had the surname 
Ewing. So of course this was a huge step in the right direction for the police and they started going through Aurora police records and databases for anyone with the surname Ewing that had ever been convicted of a crime or arrested and surprisingly there were actually quite a lot of people with the surname. Literally more than 40 people in their database had it so the police had a big task ahead of them. They were going to have to look into every single Ewing on the database and also I guess everyone within that person's family, every male that would have been around at the time of the murders, just in case they could have been the killer. So yeah, this was going to probably take a long time, months and months, if not years, to go through each person and try to determine whether or not they could be ruled out. However, I think before they even completed this task, to the police's complete surprise, just a couple of months later, in July of 2018, the lead detective detective in the case received the groundbreaking news that a match to the killer's DNA had literally just been found in the CODIS database and the match was to a man named Alex Christopher Ewing. So just for a bit of background on him, Alex Ewing was born in August of 1960. He was 58 years old by this point, by 2018, meaning he would have been around 23 years old at the time of the Bennett family murders. And what's mad is that he had actually been in prison since 1984 when the Bennett murders occurred. He was sentenced to 40 years in prison for the attempted murders of a couple named Chris and Nancy Barry. This occurred in August of 1984, so just eight months after the Bennetts were killed. Chris and Nancy Barry lived in Henderson in Nevada and one evening in August of 1984, Alex Ewing broke into their home and he attacked the couple with an axe handle. He brutally beat them around the head with it before fleeing and thankfully both Chris and Nancy did survive that attack and Ewing was arrested just days later. However this wasn't the first time that Ewing was involved in the law. It actually turns out that when Ewing broke into Chris and Nancy's home he was already a wanted man. He was on the run. You see, shortly after the Bennett family murders, in late January of 1984, Alex Ewing was arrested in Arizona for burglary and the attempted murder of a man named Roy Williams. Again, he broke into Roy's home and he attacked him. He beat him around the head with a heavy rock and luckily Roy survived the attack. And as I said, Alex Ewing was caught for this crime. He was arrested and he was behind bars whilst he awaited his trial. But during this period, the decision was made to move him to a different jail in Utah due to the fact that the jail that he was in in Arizona was currently overcrowded. So they began transporting him to Utah, but during the journey, they stopped at a gas station in Nevada. And somehow, when they stopped, Alex Ewing actually managed to escape and he made a run for it. And then and I think that same night, that was when he broke into the home of Chris and Nancy Barry. It's believed that he probably intended to hide in their home, hide from the police who were trying to find him. Obviously, as we know, he attacked Chris and Nancy and then just days after this, the police located him and he was arrested again. And following this, he was sentenced to 40 years in prison. So he was still in prison in July of 2018 when his DNA came up as a match to the killer's DNA from the Bennett crime scene. So you may be thinking, if he had been in jail all this time, then why had it taken so long for the DNA match to be made? Well, Ewing was incarcerated in the North Nevada Correctional Center, and it turns out that the state of Nevada had only put a law in place just a couple of years before 2018, which meant that those who had been convicted of a felony would be required to give their DNA, which would then be entered into the CODIS database. So when Ewing was convicted back in the 80s, it wasn't legal for his DNA to have to be put into a database yet. I mean, there was no CODIS database back then anyway. It wasn't until years and years later when this law was enacted in Nevada when finally Ewing's DNA was collected and entered into CODIS. And then shortly after this, in 2018, as we know, his DNA 
know, came up as a match to the semen evidence in the Bennett case. So now that the police investigating the Bennett case had been informed of this news in July of 2018, they immediately travelled to Nevada to interview Ewing. They wanted to see if he would admit to the Bennett family killings after all these years. But despite being informed of the DNA evidence against him, he completely denies it. He said that it wasn't him. He admitted that he did live in Colorado at the time of the Bennett murders and that during his time there he worked in construction but he denied committing the murders. But I mean of course the police did not believe him. They had solid forensic evidence which proved that he was the one who did this. And also he had a background of committing crimes that were very similar to the Bennett case. He'd literally beaten people to near death before and so they charged him. Alex Ewing was charged with the first degree murders of Bruce, Deborah and Melissa Bennett but that wasn't all that he was charged with. He was also charged with a fourth count of murder for the murder of Patricia Smith. If you recall she was raped and beaten to death less than a week before the Bennett case took place and DNA from her case also matched to Alex Ewing confirming that he killed Patricia too and so he was also charged with her murder although unfortunately the police were unable to charge him with the attempted murder of Vanessa Bennett and for the other hammer attacks in and around Aurora that we discussed earlier the attack on Donna Dixon and the attack on James and Kimberly Harbenshild because of the fact that at the time in the 80s there was apparently a law in Colorado which basically meant that there was a time limit on attempted murder cases. Apparently the police had to press charges against someone for attempted murder within three years of the crime happening or else I guess the case is closed after that. I personally really don't understand that law. I think it's quite insane but regardless that was the law in place at the time. So whilst it is strongly strongly believed that Ewing also committed those other attacks the police just weren't allowed to charge him with them now. They weren't allowed to charge him with the attempted murder of Vanessa Bennett. Ewing went to trial for the Bennett murders in 2021 and he pleaded not guilty to the crime but ultimately the DNA evidence linking him to the crime sealed his fate and the jury found him guilty of all three murders. The murders of Bruce, Deborah and Melissa Bennett and he received three life sentences. At the end of his trial the only survivor of the attack, Vanessa Bennett, who by this point in 2021 was in her early 40s, at the end of the trial she delivered a victim impact statement which I will share a quote from in a second with you but first I will just fill you in on I guess Vanessa's life up until this point in time. So like I mentioned earlier Vanessa had a horrific childhood following the murders of her family. She was bullied in school, she developed mental health issues and anger issues which caused a lot of problems between her and her grandmother Connie. Vanessa says that she knows her grandmother tried her best to give her a good life after the loss of her parents and sister. She did everything that she could but Vanessa says that she was just out of control. No one could have controlled her and as she got older, as she entered her teenage years, her anger issues just got worse and so Vanessa was sent away to a boarding school for a period of time but when she returned home her mental health just continued to decline and she actually made an attempt on her life. She tried to kill herself. Following this she was admitted into a psychiatric hospital and after she was discharged from there she was sent to a group home until the age of 18 and at the age of 19 she began using drugs to try and cope with her mental health. Vanessa described how she started using heroin regularly in an attempt to quote make everything go away and she used heroin for several years for much of her adulthood she was addicted to drugs and so she was homeless for a period of time. At one point she was living underneath a bridge. In her victim impact statement at the end of Alex Ewing's trial Vanessa said quote I didn't just lose my parents and my sister I lost the person who I was supposed to be. I lost my sanity. I look in the mirror every day and look at myself and I hate who I am and I hate what I had to go through and still go through. I hurt myself. I 
was a drug addict for so many years. I'm a very strong person though, but when it comes to my family, that was the most important thing to me in the whole world. However, some really, really good news that I can share with you now is that Vanessa has managed to get sober and life is really starting to look up for her now. She says that she has started taking classes and that she is in training to be a drug counsellor. That is what she wants to do with her life. She wants to help others who are also struggling with drug addiction just like she did for so long, which I just think is so inspirational. Despite everything that she has gone through in her life, she hasn't given up and she's just trying to dedicate her life to being there for others now. But going back to Alex Ewing, as well as being convicted of the Bennett family murders, Ewing was also convicted of the murder of Patricia Smith just last year, according to sources. He was convicted of her murder in April of 2022 and given another life sentence. So there is no chance in hell that he will be getting out of prison. He will die behind bars, thank goodness. And that concludes this case. That is the case of the hammer killer, Alex Ewing. It took about 37 years in total to bring him to justice for the Bennett family murders and the murder of Patricia Smith. But thank God he was caught for that when he was, because something I neglected to mention before actually is that by the time the DNA match to him was made, he was actually due to be coming up for parole relatively soon, I think in the next couple of years. So thank goodness the match was made before that because if he was let out then god knows what else he would have done he could have taken the lives of even more people but yeah that is it for this case as always please do let me know your thoughts and opinions on the case in the comments also feel free to let me know of any other cases that you would like to see me cover on this channel they can be solved cases unsolved cases serial killer cases you name it thank you all so much for watching please do give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already and I will see you again next week for another mystery with Molly. Bye!